hello everyone, good afternoon and welcome to this session entitled Partnerships for a Sustainable and Green Future. Uh, my name is Eleanor Brooks, I'm a lecturer uh, in health policy at the University of Edinburgh and I'll be moderating the session. The session is organised by the Young Forum uh, Gastein and it brings together two really important themes. So, so first of all, the impact of climate change upon health uh, and second of all, uh, the role of partnerships as a tool for health governance. So we're going to be talking about both of those things. So we're all aware that climate is a key determinant of health and the impacts that climate change has upon health. Where we're perhaps missing an opportunity is working with our colleagues in environment, as we have been doing, to tackle the climate crisis, to also learn from their experiences about multi-stakeholder partnerships and the role that those can play uh, in governing health and in addressing some of the impacts upon health. So there are two aims for this session. The first is to reflect a little bit upon uh, the health impacts of climate change, on how the measures that we're taking to tackle the climate crisis might also improve health. But secondly, it's also designed for us to try and derive lessons from the experiences that we've seen in climate governance, where partnerships have been used for, for some time now, to inform our approach to the use of partnerships in health governance. So we're really looking forward to diving into those two things equally as we travel through the session. So we've got a great panel of speakers with us and I'm going to dive into introducing them uh, and outlining the session itself in just a second. But first of all, we wanted to run a quick Q&A to warm us up and to see what we know already about the impacts of climate change upon health and also what we think and how we feel about the role of partnerships within health governance. So the team are very kindly sharing the questions. You have a QR code and there are some instructions coming in the chat uh, so that you can get involved with the Slido. Uh, there are going to be three questions. The first of all is this multiple choice one that you can see on the screen now. So you either need to, to, uh, to scan the QR code there and you can check in the chat for some more detailed instructions about, about how to do that so that you're able to get involved. So the first question we have is this one. How many of the hottest years on record have been recorded since 2015? And you have a multiple choice selection there of three, five or six. Uh, so we'll give that a couple of seconds just as people are arriving and settling in to see how much we know. So for those who are just joining us, welcome along. Uh, we're just getting started with a poll to get everybody warmed up and see what we already know about the impacts of, uh, of climate change upon health. Uh, you have a QR code in the corner of the screen there. There are also some instructions in the chat if you want to download the app so that you can get involved in the interactive element of the session. Uh, and our first question is this one. It's a multiple choice question. How many of the hottest years on record have been recorded since 2015? All right, so I'll give that five or six more seconds and then I'll ask the team just to reveal the responses that we've had thus far. Okay, so the vast majority of people are opting for five out of the last six years, which makes me think that people have read the Lancet's countdown to health and climate change report, because uh, if the team skip forward one slide, we'll see that that is the correct answer. I should add as an academic that I am confident there are other sources that will give a different measurement and a different answer, but I think if you answered five or six, you can consider yourself correct on that question. <laughs> um, so well done to everybody. Could the team put up the second question on the poll for us? Super, thank you. So this one is a slightly different format. Here we're looking for a collective word cloud of what we think the health impacts of climate change might be. So here you just need to type into the box. It's a free text option. Anything that comes to mind that you think might be um, a health impact of climate change. While people are doing that, maybe I can offer some ideas. So, so the source of data we're using for these questions is the Lancet's countdown report on health and climate change. And they use a whole range of indicators. It's, it's, a, it's a really vast report. Um, uh, and cover things like cardiorespiratory disease, heat exposure, infectious diseases, but also things like food insecurity and malnutrition, the impact upon mental health. So really thinking quite widely about where we think these impacts might fall and how they might filter through to have negative health outcomes. So, so we're not focused purely on the health sector and the report is certainly not focused purely on the health sector, but thinking quite broadly about what we think these impacts might be. So there are some great examples coming in already. I'll just give everybody a few more seconds to type in the things that they think might, might be the key impacts. Uh, 
Okay, so we've got some really interesting themes coming through here. Things like drowning that we that we don't really think about very much, but certainly um, people making this link to food security and, and the climate determining our ability to produce food and food and distribute food, and, and then linking that to malnutrition, migration and displacement as another really important theme. People being forced to move um, and change places because of the impacts of climate change mental health that's high, higher up the agenda than it would have been some years ago. So that's really good to see coming through as well. Changing urban design, that's really interesting. I hope we can pick that up in the discussion a bit later on. There are some variations on enhancing or increasing health inequalities. That's another really important point. So we, we knew that was a problem to start with. And we, we also know that this is only exacerbating that issue. Um, Okay, that's a really good good range of things there. Critical, I think, is that we're, we're thinking well outside of the box. We're not just thinking about the stuff that's going to direct, uh, uh, the, that impacts upon health immediately and the health system immediately, but a much broader set of impacts than that, which is why partnerships are going to be so important as we, as we govern this area, because it's not restricted just to the health sector. Super, could the team just put up the final of the Q&A questions? So we're going back to a uh, multiple choice format here. But here we're looking for you to choose the statement that best sums up how you feel about partnerships as a tool of governance. So this is something a little bit different. And I think it's a really interesting starting point, particularly given that the purpose of the session is to try and derive some lessons about partnerships. Um, so, so which of these statements most closely reflects how you feel about partnerships as a tool for addressing uh, the climate challenge? So firstly, the interest of different stakeholders can't be aligned. That's maybe the statement if you have some concerns or, or feel that there's some, some difficulty with the use of partnerships in this context. Second is a bit more of a balanced statement. So, so recognising that with regulation and the right tools, partnerships can, can work and can be a really fruitful way of approaching these challenges. Thirdly, partnerships are great, much more in support, see the value of this, understand how this can work completely support this as an approach. Fourthly, and, and in many ways, this ought to be the most dominant response, not really sure, given that the idea of the session is to try and help us learn. So if you're, you're just not sure, I'm going to think about this as we go through, that's the statement for you. So we'll just give a couple of seconds just to try and get a sense of the, the initial feeling about partnerships as a mode of governance. Okay, maybe the team could show us the results of that poll. Okay, super. So majority, although not by too far, this more balanced option, we see the, the, the virtues of these things and the value of a partnership also recognize some of the risks and the need to balance those. And, and perhaps the best thing we can take from this session then is some sense of the, the regulations and the structures that we need to put in place to make sure that partnerships are delivering on what they're supposed to. Uh, second is the more supportive, more optimistic one. That's better than the alternative. So great. Um, super. OK, I think that gives us lots to work with uh, for the start of the session. Um, so let's dive in. Um, I'm being supported by our wonderful colleagues at the Gastine Forum who are, are doing the tech for us. But I'm also delighted to be joined by our distinguished panel of speakers. Um, so I will briefly introduce them. Uh, Joaquim De Genio is joining us, uh, Senior Advisor to the European Commission's Directorate General for Environment. Uh, we're also joined by Aoife O'Leary, Director of International Shipping and Carbon Pricing for the Environmental Defence Fund. Uh, Yoni Kiranen, CEO of the Climate Leadership Coalition, joining us as well. And Robert Offner, who is co-founder of ANO Solar and an alumni of the Young Forum Gastein. So thank you all for taking time out and joining us this afternoon. We're also thrilled to have with us two members of the Young Forum Gastein, um, who'll be helping us to reflect on the discussions, summarising what we've heard. Um, they, are, um, they are Sarah Mandia, uh, an EU Public Affairs um, Officer with Novartis, and Sophia Ribeiro, Public Health Consultant. So thanks guys for joining us, uh, and we'll see Sarah and Sophia a little bit later on. So the session is going to run in two parts. We'll start with a panel discussion. Um, and we'll identify some good examples of partnerships and, and some of the lessons that we can derive from them. Then in the second part of the session, we're going to open that up to a Q&A, so reflect a little bit on what we've heard, get some input from the young Gasteiners and also from the audience uh, more broadly. Finally, of course, we're joined by all of you in our audience and we'd love to hear from you. So you have access to a chat. Please do make use of that. Tell us what you'd like to hear, what you'd like to hear further reflections on. If you've got any examples of partnerships from your field or your experience that, that have been good or beneficial, any areas where you think partnerships might provide a valuable avenue for governance and a, and a nice way of approaching a problem that we face. All of that's what the chat is for. So please put that in. We'll monitor that throughout and then we'll be able to put some of those questions to the panelists a bit later on. So let's start with our speakers. Um, 
We asked our speakers in advance to think of one example of a partnership that they think has been particularly promising and to summarise three things about it in three sentences. So those three things were what is the partnership, what is the partnership trying to address, what's the issue that it tackles, secondly why does it work, what's the key thing that, that's making it successful and thirdly what challenges has it faced. Uh, so we're hoping for a concise summary of a good example of a partnership to get us going so that we can derive some lessons from these things. Um, Robert, if it's all right, could I start with you for your example of the partnership? Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. So the partnership I'm trying to build is um, we, as a small startup, we are creating partnerships with local communities to put forward and, and help to contribute to the energy transition, which is one part of the puzzle, which will help this whole transition, which is necessary to a carbon-free economy and maybe a circular economy. So um, yeah, we are building photovoltaic power plants with um, crowdfunded from the local population. So what we experience is we get more engagement out of this. We um, raise the awareness concerning consumption of energy. And especially if we build in um, a battery, for example, in the local context, people really are conscious about the energy use and um, yeah, start to think about it because they can check it on their phone, how much energy is coming from the roof and from the battery and how much they need. So this is my short contribution. That's super, thank you. Can I push you on one thing that you think is helping it to work and be particularly successful? What is it about it that makes it um, such a good partnership? Well, um, I think you need to put your money where your mouth is. So um, it really, um, does, it helps people save money. And, and in the end, many people think, like I experienced many said, yeah, we want to make green and have um, reduced emissions, but in the end, it's very much down to money. And if it's the better option and it's if it's cheaper, then they would go for it. And if the neighbor has it, and the neighbor has a photovoltaic bulb and they want one too. So it's, um, yeah, word of mouth, it's really helpful. And an element of healthy competition by the sounds of it, good. I think there's some really interesting points there about sort of behavioral nudges that we might might pick up as well as a, as a good tool for, for running these partnerships. Okay, super, thank you. Um, Aoife, could I pass over to you? Yeah, definitely, thanks. Um, so one of my main areas of work is international shipping. So the absolutely giant ships that bring absolutely everything that you're touching or standing on or whatever to wherever you are right now. Um, they emit as much as the entire country of Germany every year. So incredibly significant emissions. And the partnership that I'm part of is the Getting to Zero Coalition. And what they did was bring together the most ambitious parts of the shipping industry around a pledge of zero emissions by 2050. And the reason that that to me is incredibly successful is the shipping industry is very conservative, right? Most of us don't see it. We don't think about it. We don't worry about it. Um, it's also just incredibly unsafe for the crew on those ships. They don't deal with a lot of regulation. So they really have no climate regulation in place. And the traditional trade bodies that represent the shipping industry in regulation forums basically would not go anywhere near such an ambitious um, proposal. And so by picking off the most ambitious parts and bringing them together and kind of forming a new body, that has really actually thrown open the possibility for regulation and really moved the entire dialogue forward. So I think it's a really, really exciting and successful partnership. Whether we can translate that now into regulation that will actually um, decarbonize is like the next step and definitely the next challenge, but we're at least further along than we were before the partnership. It's super. So the thing that's making that successful is that you've managed to um, sort of free the members of the partnership from the structures that they were in before that were restricting the ability to, to set such ambitious targets. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, definitely. And it's also about being exclusionary, right? Like we don't want any shipping company or, you know, it's, it's not just shipping companies, it's also energy companies and some of the things like that. We're very selective. We want to know in advance that they are going to be ambitious because we don't want to create just another lowest common denominator forum, right? We want to make sure that this is the ambitious section of the industry and will actually drive that ambition. So we've actually said no to some companies if we just don't believe that they're actually really uh yeah, willing to sign up to the goals. 
that's really interesting super great thank you um Joachim I'll turn to you if I may I recognize that um the commission deals with a whole range of partnerships so it's perhaps not appropriate for you to speak about one in particular but maybe you could give us a sense based on the work that you do about sort of sort of successful strategies that you've seen and the things that you've seen that can help partnerships to work and to deliver on what they've promised Uh, yes, indeed. And I think that uh, you know that we in, in the Commission are trying to, to foster and, and mobilize partnerships to, to, to join the, the Green Deal ambition, to join the European Green Deal transition, because it's absolutely clear that uh, this is not a project uh, from Brussels or from the European Commission. It has to be a societal project. And that's why we can only play a, a role of, uh, of triggering such, such initiatives, such, such partnerships. And I'm really happy with uh, with the work that uh, my colleagues uh, are doing, for instance, in the context of the European Climate Pact. We have also a platform for, for a circular economy, a circular economy stakeholder platform, or for instance, a business uh, for biodiversity partnership. Uh, and, and, and through that, and I think that's what I wanted to say as a main message, through that, we see a lot of different actors from different backgrounds coming together that probably would not meet otherwise and that join forces. And once you define a common goal, a long-term uh, ambition, a vision, and, and create ownership that everybody can sign up to this, then you see the most fascinating uh, partnerships emerging from, from, this, uh, from this process. But we also know we need many more of them. We are at, at the start of this, of this big transition. And, and I think uh, that's probably the biggest challenge if I want to finish with that point is that how to scale it up from one particular partnership in one particular area, which, which may be restricted in terms of uh, scope or in terms of uh, location, in terms of geographical scope. Uh, how do we scale this up for, for the whole continent? And I think that's going to be the question that we haven't found the answer, but that I would hope uh, to learn a little, little bit more today in the discussions, because I think we're all in this together. Otherwise, we will not be able to succeed in this, in this big project. Thank you. That sounds like an excellent question for us to try and, and make sure we've addressed when we come to the discussion. Thank you, that's super. Yoni, I know you have some slides to share with us about your uh, example um, partnership, so hopefully the team can put those up for us. Super. And then please, the floor is yours to uh, to describe to us the example that you've chosen to show. Okay, thank you. So uh, just background information, this Climate Leadership Coalition, we started in 2014 and now we are the largest business climate network in EU according to our knowledge. We have more than 60 companies uh, joined us and the, the leaders, the CEOs or chairman of the boards are, are the official members. Then we have some cities, some universities and think tanks and then we belong to the international networks. We mean Business Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition, Climate Kick and Hydrogen Europe. Then the next slide. So then please click all, all the boxes open. So then we are working with all the areas which are changing. So energy, uh, industry, new materials, buildings, uh, transport, new ways of doing food and bioeconomy, and then also activating citizens for cleaner choices. So we have all kinds of partnerships, um, what, what we have been seeing, but there are like two, two ones which are the most crucial ones. One is the the global partnership for scaling up the carbon pricing because today only 22 percent of the greenhouse gases have any kind of price and and the countries are collecting something like 40 billion dollars annually with the carbon price then the direct fossil subsidies are 10 times higher and then the indirect damages mainly with health effects are 100 times higher so if you don't change this scheme this uh, this concept we will never get the investments on time what we really need because the companies need to have positive business cases for the for the clean investments so this is number one like um, collaboration activity in our mind and we have established the call on carbon initiative for this and actually today we discussed with the collaboration we have already like uh, we mean business coalition signed in icc signed in and so on so if you're interested google the website and then the other thing is that uh, this public-private partnerships that, for example, Finland is one of the pioneers in biofuels. So the biofuel refinery started when the public sector guaranteed some demand for it. So we made a blending application, 2% of the fuels, and that triggered the biofuel investments. And we see that there's a lot of things what we can do with this kind of trigger elements. So if you put a carbon footprint 
as a criteria for public procurement. Then we can speed up the new ways of doing food, new ways of, of doing transport, new ways of doing energy and other materials. So this is also the other, other really beneficial uh, way of partnership. And then please, next slide. So then I'm really happy that this health is, is high on the agenda in this forum, because we are, we are also starting a theme area from the, for the health effects and climate change. And as a, as a, we got a presentation from IMF, and they, for example, calculated that even last year, 3.5 times more people died for the air pollution than COVID, which gives some perspective for the problem. Then next slide. And then the, the main damage is, like I told, that uh, if you collect 40 billion with the carbon price, we subsidize the fossils with 500 billion, and then we have 5 trillion uh, embedded costs in our society, which is like 7% of the world GDP. So then it means that majority of that is the green part is for the health effects. And also climate change accelerated health effects are coming bigger uh, every year. Then next slide. So this one I don't need to go through because actually in the beginning there was a good voting. What are the most important health effects of climate change? Next slide. And then finally, if you are more interested what we do and what our concepts are, we just published a book a, year, uh, a week ago called At the Crossroads. That's free of charts, uh, digital version on our website. And there was an evaluation in the, in the Forbes magazine on that. So uh, this is something what you are interested, if you are interested to study this further. So this was my, my first uh, short intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Yoni, that's super. Can I just, um, as a quick follow-up, so the, the two partnerships that you gave examples of, can you just summarise which uh, particular type of stakeholders are involved in those? So is that is that purely business actors or does that also involve, I don't know, policymakers and civil society and, and, and sort of wider range of actors? So, so this global carbon pricing, we really wish that the EU, USA, China and about 10 other countries, like-minded countries will create a partnership. A little bit like happened in Paris, the High Ambition Coalition. So if we could have a high ambition coalition with the, with the carbon pricing. And by the way, we have EDF person here on board, so we would be happy to collaborate. I have been working with Nat Kehan in the past, and uh, this is something what EDF has also been promoting. So we try to create a coalition. Today we got a meet, meeting with um, Guntram Wolf from Bruegel. Yesterday we got Johan Rockström from Potsdam, and then we will approach Brookings. So we try to create a consortium how we can help even with these institutes to help this drive this forward. But uh, I, I will also con offer this opportunity to collaborate for EDF. It certainly sounds like the spirit of partnerships and collaboration is alive and well in environment and climate, which is precisely what we're here to learn from. Thank you very much, Yoni. Um, okay, I'm going to dive into some questions sort of individually for, for, for panel members. So thanks for, for responding to that sort of more general collective question. Joachim, if I can start with you, that the, you know, the, the EU has set some really ambitious uh, climate targets. And I guess what I'm wondering is what role the Commission foresees uh, for partnerships in helping to achieve those? Why is it specifically that partnerships are seen as necessary or valuable to achieving those goals? And, and how do you see that working? Yeah, thank you very much. And I think it's really, really good uh, to have, have this dialogue and bringing the, the different topics together. And, and let me start by saying the EU has not only set the very ambitious climate goals, of course we have, but we've set out the European Green Deal. And I think what is really important to, to, to start off is that we, that we are facing a multiple crisis. So it's the climate crisis, of course, first and foremost, but we also have biodiversity loss. We have a resource use that is excessive and we have pollution, as Uni said. So there, there's, there's, there's a number of global challenges that if, if not addressed, um, they, they will really bring the, the planet and humanity to its, to its knees, so to say. And they are all interconnected. And I think that's the key message. I think we're having, we're having with the European Green Deal spearheaded by the climate goals, we're having really a, a very holistic and long-term vision that addresses these multiple uh, uh, crises and challenges in, a, in, a, in an integrated way. And we are working particularly uh, in, in relation, for instance, to the zero pollution ambition, where we have tried to, to, to link up uh, the dimension of uh, these other elements, the, the climate crisis, the climate uh, uh, policy, uh, the, the biodiversity and uh, circular economy policy to how we can address this to reduce pollution. And one thing that is, I think is extremely important to say, and uh, again, the slides from uni were very telling in that is that 
if you act on one uh, of these uh, elements, you often have benefits for others. And, and what is extremely important is that we spend our money wisely so that we invest one euro and have the maximum impact in all the dimensions. If we only look at one single issue, we will, we will basically risk uh, basically missing the trick, not having enough resources uh, to, to, to really uh, tackle the challenges ahead. And therefore, partnerships are really there to bring these different actors together, to break down the silos and to have really the spirit of, uh, of, of working to, together towards uh, these, this common vision and these common goals. And, and, and of course, we in the, in the, in the commission, uh, on one hand, believe, of course, that in order to frame this and to have a clear understanding what we're aiming at and not to leave that in, 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 a, in an abstract way, uh, regulation, legislation is, is important. That's why we, we set out the climate law. That's why we're setting uh, now the ambitions down in, in laws for, for various other sectors, for example. And, and, and I think that's really the key to, to, to start off. But any legislation will not come to life if there are not actors who help implement them. Yes, it's the member states. In the EU legal framework, it's the member states first and foremost, but also the member states cannot act by themselves if businesses, society, research and innovation all come together towards this goal. So I think for us, partnerships are an extremely um, uh, essential uh, part of the mix to translate the high level of ambition that we have set out and the legislation that we're putting in place into reality, because nothing is worse than having uh, something on paper that is not implemented on the ground. And let me finish by saying, uh, I think this is also very important for us, for, for, for President von der Leyen and the whole commission team now in the light of the future of Europe. You know that we've started a discussion about the future of Europe. And I think one of the frustrations that a lot of people have uh, with Europe, with the European Union is that there's a lot of talk, it takes a long time, and then it has no or limited impact or sometimes perceived negative impact on, on their daily lives. And we have to change that. And that cannot be done centrally from one place that has to come from the ground, from people taking up the challenge, being part of the solution and helping to, to translate this uh, uh, generation project uh, in, in, in reality. So, so that's why I think partnerships are an essential part and there are so many different ones. So it's really difficult to make a general statement, but I think it's really, really great that we have this discussion today to think a little bit more how we can make better use of that tool. Thank you. I think that's a really good starting point. So, so you seem to have identified already sort of three roles that the partnerships play. So. So one is to overcome the silo problem that we know is an issue and particularly in health, we know is an issue because health is affected by everything else and we sometimes struggle to be engaged in those debates. One is to overcome the implementation challenge that we, we quite commonly see. We adopt the policy, implementing the policy, not as easy as it might look on paper. Partnerships might help us there. And then the third perhaps is to, to provide an ownership sense, right? Which is linked to this implementation problem. If people feel ownership of the thing, then the implementation might happen more smoothly. I think that's a really, really good starting point. Aoife, can I can I turn to you? So we hear a lot about this about technological innovation and how that's going to help us to solve the climate challenge. I'm wondering if you have a view on the role of societal innovation, on the way in which we do politics and engage people in, in campaigns around these issues and, and, and whether there are innovative approaches there that we should also be drawing on. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, so the Environmental Defence Fund is a really big uh, NGO, so I can't go through all of our partnerships. So you know, I've already spoken about one and then it got called out on another already, which is great. Um, so maybe just two examples. Um, so one is the Moms Clean Air Task Force, as we call it. So that is an innovation where they're basically we've tried to activate mothers around schools that are in places that have really poor air quality. And so that's very much a health um, or originated as a health partnership Um but actually has come really to do a lot more on climate. It's mainly US based. There are similar groups um, like that in Europe, um, but the one we work in is mainly US. But really what that has, uh, I guess, transformed into, which was a very local initiative and very much looking at local regulation in terms of buses and, and road use and things like that, then bit by bit kind of also took on a much more policy and campaigning side so now they get regular alerts about different, I mean, in the US, there's state level and federal level regulations and how they can influence them. 
Um, and they also do demonstrations every so often, go along, take their placards out and, you know, campaign for, for clean air for their kids. So we definitely do a lot um, on the society side as well as the technology side. And I guess on the technology side, one of the things I did want to highlight was we have this Transform Net Zero initiative, which brings together um, a whole go of really, really giant businesses. So we're talking IKEA, Microsoft, Nike, places like that to commit to zero by 2050. But in addition to that, actually let us go in and help them figure out what is their pathway and how do we actually get there? So it's not just the, um, the target or the goal, but also then taking a real deep dive and going, okay, but like concretely, <laughs> how are we going to do this? So that I think is some of the, yeah, the added value that EDF can bring along to those partnerships. That's interesting. That sounds like a similar sort of implementation problem that Joaquin was mentioning where, okay, we set the thing, but then how are we actually going to go, go about doing it? Can I just follow up and ask about the, the, the network of mums uh, that you mentioned? Is that a top-down initiative or a bottom-up initiative? So were they working at local level and then managed to sort of, with EDF, help to organise uh, uh, between themselves? Or was that an EDF idea that filtered down? Um, it was originally a, a bottom-up one. So some moms kind of formed these task forces. Actually, I think there were a few formed uh, kind of simultaneously around um, the United States, but what EDF managed to do was work with them to get funding, to put them on a much more kind of sustainable uh, level and get actual staff in to help them organize and get on top of the policy and you know give them that kind of regular advice so that most of the members are just you know moms who get random alerts every so often and come in for a uh, demonstration or they send off an email to their senator or whatever it is but now with EDF's help they've been able to figure out how to get that uh, funding because that's not an easy thing to do for grassroots groups so we've managed to then kind of build that out so in some areas it kind of is top down in that we've kind of taken the model and brought it to new areas um, but very much try to still give ownership to the the moms in whatever area it is. Super thing. It sounds like there's a lot of overlap there with the sort of approach that AO Solar have taken that, that Robert might be able to speak to as well of, of taking a model that works and, and moving it to other places. Thank you. Um, Yoni, can I come to you? So the Climate Leadership Coalition um, works on business solutions to the climate crisis. And I know that you in your in your out of work life work on, on individual uh, responses to the climate crisis. I'm wondering if you could say something about how you see the balance between those two things. So the responsibility of business to, to, to solve this problem for us and the responsibility of individuals to do their part. Can you reflect on that a little bit from your experience? Yes. Thank you for the good question, because actually it's kind of funny history that I was working in the energy company called Fortum for a long time. And then I ended up to establish another association called Storm Warning with our leading musicians and artists, movie stars from Finland. And then they wanted to contribute on, on climate issues. And then we discussed that what kind of a, what is the core of this artist movement. And then we wanted to highlight this walk the talk that there are so many, like actually it's kind of interesting thing that this uh, climate protest was interrupted in Helsinki today. <laughs> With this, um, with this movement. But anyway, we, we, we wanted to do it from the positive side, that actually we wanted to show that there are actually many selections what you can do with energy, transport, food, and, and they kind of uh, are financially attractive if you use some time to find a good solutions for you. And then also the food, that the new, new food, even vegan food, is very tasty if you know how to do it. So this is, was the positive side, what we try to do with the Storm Warning Association. And that, is, uh, that has worked quite well, actually, that when the people are showing in their own life and then they, they, tell, they tell their own experiences that uh, what, what works and what don't work, that is, has a big power. And then when I worked in, in Fortum, I was doing uh, several years, I was in the charge of the power plant technology development division. And I noticed that if some consumption of some clean stuff is increasing, even 2% a year, and then the dirty stuff is decreasing 2% a year. Immediately, the investments start to go to the clean side. And then they will come cheaper, and then they will come better. And that is the scaling factor, which then helps the, helps the development. So I would say that um, the systemic thinking, carbon price and such, are the key driver. But without consumer movements and consumer selections, 
we cannot make it either. So they have important role, especially in accelerating the, the new uh, products and services. And this is also my message to Greta Thunberg and all the activists that please don't forget it, because sometimes they are influencing only the people to vote in a direct way. But in reality, every single time when an individual is doing a clean choice, it's like voting for the companies. It is registered. It increases the appetite for the companies to develop more the clean solutions. So therefore, I think that this is like um, something low hanging fruit, which is not fully exploited yet by, by, the, by the young movements. So you think the one thing is feeding the other, as it were, the, the one yes, action will yes. generate the other. And okay. walking the talk, because I know some associations also in the US, there is citizens climate lobby. So they train people to go to speak with politicians on carbon pricing. But if the people are not doing things in their own life, their message is weak. It is much stronger if they have done something like I have uh, driven electric cars, now I have a biogas car. So if, if I doing this myself, then I have more concrete things to tell the politicians that if you would help be a little bit better loading docks for the electric vehicles here and there, so then it becomes more concrete. And then I'm showing with my own act, actions, my commitment for the climate actions as well. So this will become even much, much stronger political force if you're also doing things. So therefore, I believe this walking the talk is, is really the key thing. Super, thank you. I can see that Eva has a question, and I assume that is in response to Yoni's comments, but I'm just going to put a question to Robert and then I'm going to come right back to you. Um, Robert, I'm fascinated by the way that this works at ANO Solar. So, so you're assisting communities to set up a crowdfunding situation and then install solar panels within their communities that, that will then supply their power. And, and that's based on a notion of circular economy. And I'm wondering if you can tell us something about the impacts of the project, so on the, the communities themselves and, uh, and how it's affecting the way in which they operate sort of politically, as it were. Yeah, we um, we saw this need because if you don't have the funding right now, let's say you live in a, in a building with many flats and I'm just renting a flat. I'm not going to invest in a photovoltaic power plant on my roof. And um, for example, if I'm a community, a little town, a village, they very often don't have the money or the, they don't want to like um, have this headache of taking another, on another project. So what we find um, is we can have this solution for them and they um, get cheaper electricity. They now with the rules and regulations in place in Austria, they can even share electricity which is really cool because now, like a few years ago, I could only use it in your own house, in your own home, but now you can share it with your neighbor in the local community. So everybody becomes a prosumer kind of. I'm not only consuming, but I'm also sharing and producing. And um, yeah, what, what you only just said, you need to walk the talk and these little things um, help also to, to strengthen the people I see because very often we hear these multiple crises and so many problems and it's overwhelming, even for me, especially if I'm reading all those reports. And um, these little actions help me to stay sane. And I see this effect with other people as well. These little actions, because they, 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 they are marginal, but they contribute. And they um, very often we have this cognitive dissonance, like we know our behavior, like um, flying around the world is wonderful, I love it, but it has a huge impact. But we are doing so many actions which we know are not healthy and this um, feeds our denial. And these small concrete actions um, contribute to this awareness and this well-being, I think, on many aspects and, uh, and foster communities. Like when you have a photovoltaic power plant on your roof, the next step is, hey, you want to use it to the fullest and don't um, feed so much electricity back to the grid because the money you get from the grid and the grid provider is very small. So you want to use, make the most use out of it. So the next step is you get an electric car so you can charge it yourself at home. And then you can actually you know, not drive for free, but for a really small amount of money. And for example, I see even old people um, 60, 70, 80 years old to still driving around with a new electric car and they find it super easy. If you just get used to it, it's, it's wonderful. And 
and then they talk to their neighbors and so on. And this is this nudging what you mentioned before. It's really um, yeah, at a small steps. And so we, we start a conversation and then this conversation leads to maybe more deep reasoning why we have to change our behavior and um, support companies and political parties and movements and so on in order to yeah, keep our planet habitable. I think that's I think that's summed up really well, and I'm really interested in in so so you're 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 describing a sort of spillover from one decision into another decision, all of which are, are beneficial and reinforcing. But then you also mentioned that they talk to each other, and the thing that was coming to my mind is well, if you're having a meeting about working with Aedo Solar and establishing your solar panels on your roof. I'm willing to bet that within that meeting, you're then also going to have a discussion about some other issue in the in the block that you live in, or you're going to meet somebody that you didn't know before, and the sort of socialization health benefits that are going to come with that community building aspect of the whole process, even regardless of what it is that you're doing, uh, are surely really important as well. Um, I think that's a nice example. Aoife, you had a hand up uh, just before I speak to Robert, please go ahead. Yeah, well, I think actually Robert has, has kind of um, brought in a lot of what I wanted to say, but just in, in um, I guess, response to Yoni, I just find that emphasis on the individual um, problematic in many ways, um, because there's so little that any of us can do. And I agree with you, right? We should all be making the greenest choices possible. And to the extent we choose a green company over another, that is a vote with our money or whatever. But actually, the very best thing we could do is choose no company at all, right? We need to all look at, you know, the example of flying, right? It's much better to not fly than to choose the greenest airline. Um, and I think that's one of the, the issues that I see a lot of the time with the emphasis on what each of us are doing. Like we give the example of electric vehicles. Well, great uh, if you could afford it, but a lot of people can't. Um, and I would just very much throw the emphasis much back on business because a lot of them have been operating, causing harm to society. And we have basically been allowing them to do that without paying for it. Um, so I really like Robert's kind of way of putting it in like the community spirit. And if you can come together and do that, great. But I would definitely de-emphasize uh, trying to push responsibility onto people individ as individuals. Um, I just don't think that that is really right in terms of where we are in the climate crisis right now. I think that's really interesting. And part of what I think is interesting is, is the majority of the community that, that are in the audience are going to be from um, public health. And I just wonder if people see the same overlaps with an emphasis on individual responsibility for things like non-communicable diseases. You know, that's a debate where we we have an ongoing issue with people framing those as an individual responsibility about lifestyle choices and the decisions that we make. And actually what we know from public health research is that we have much less control over the situations that we're in that determine our health than, than perhaps, the, you know, that sort of framing would would lead us uh, lead us to believe. Um, we're definitely going to be able to pick this up as we go through. I'm just going to pick up a couple of questions from the Q&A because there are a few things coming in, which I think it would be fun to address. Uh, yeah, good. So great to hear tangible examples from Robert. What do the panelists generally think are the biggest challenges in innovation for a sustainable and green future? I think that's a great question. I'm going to challenge somebody to define innovation when they answer that. So innovation, I'm concerned, is one of those words that we throw around as if we know what it means. And I think it actually means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So I'm happy for any of the panelists to answer that, but to please specify whether they mean innovation in the way that businesses work and engage with with tackling the climate crisis, whether they mean societal innovation in the way that we engage publics in campaigns, whether they mean technical innovation in the way that we use technology to tackle the climate crisis, any of those things I think is fine, but I think that's a question that's worth specifying in terms of, of what kind of innovation we're thinking of. Yoni, please go ahead. The, one of the biggest innovations would be to go to service-based models that instead of selling, for example, electricity or heat as a kilowatt hours, we should start to sell lightning, cooling or, or um, heating. And then it immediately brings the incentive for the, for the energy companies to save as much energy as possible to avoid it. And, and that is something where also the public private sector could collaborate very efficiently. So if the public sector starts to buy these as a service, and I will tell you an example. There was a Finnish company who resorted the LED lights manufacturing from China to Finland. I knew the chairman of that company. And then I say that, do I read the news right? 
that you are moving manufacturing. First, you moved that from Finland to China, and now you are taking it back. Why you are doing it? They say that they are starting to sell lightning as a service. So then they need to have a super high quality lamps, never need to be maintained, and they are very energy efficient. And when they come back after the, this uh, rental period, when they come back to their, their factory, they can be perfectly reused. So then for the circular economy purposes. And that was really eye-opening thing for me, that if, if you start to sell things as a service, transport as a service, lighting as a service, energy as a service, that may be doing a huge change. And also relating to this um, previous comment on these consumer choices. So I believe that these consumer choices are really important because I have seen that it's, it's too much discussion, for example, that Norwegians to, should stop producing oil. So if the demand is still there, somebody else will produce that instead of Norway. So this is like the drug business, I mean, marijuana and others. As long as there is consumption, somebody will deliver, somebody will grow the things and somebody will sell, even if it's illegal. So therefore, it's so important to influence the, the consumption and do the changes over there. So to me, the first guys who bought Tesla are the true heroes, because they enabled Tesla to scale up and then to, to change the whole industry. So therefore, I see that the consumption is, is not the key driver, but it is very important driver in this change. I think this is a really interesting line of discussion on, on where we're putting the emphasis about how to tackle this challenge. Um, I just want to return to the to partnerships for a moment, um, but I should let anybody else on the panel who wants to respond on innovation do so. Is that a question that anybody wants to pick up, particular innovations that we think would be important for a green and sustainable future? Uh, Aoife, yeah, please. Yeah, I mean, quite quickly, I think um, the biggest innovation that we need to do as a society is rethink how we fund our society. Um, because at the moment, it's, it's that classic economics uh, kind of line, you should tax the bads and support the goods. And a lot of our, um, basically all member states get a lot of money from income taxes, et cetera. Um, and we need to be really going hard. And I think this comes into the carbon pollution, um, carbon pricing um, discussion that we had earlier, at least mentioned. It's, there's, there's a whole, go of things that we need to be discouraging and that comes back actually to the point you only just made about demand you know there's still a huge amount of subsidy going into oil and gas production and we are not subsidizing things like hydrogen or you know other potential solutions to the same extent so i would say finance is the part to me that really needs the innovation to unlock I think that's really interesting, particularly in light of the EU's role and perhaps even the European Commission's role, not wishing to uh, anticipate Joaquin's comment, but please, Joaquin, go ahead. <laughs> no, I think, I mean, I wasn't so much trying to, to look at our role, but I think it's super important and I agree with the previous speakers. I mean, there's there's different types of innovation that we need to look into. And obviously we, we uh, in the Commission try to work on, on the various angles. And it's a huge topic, but I wanted just to highlight two, two examples from, uh, from a technological innovation side, which made me think uh, uh, recently about innovation a different way. Innovation we often associate with uh, technological innovation with, with com something completely new that we don't know about. But if you think about the hype and the diversity of, of bicycles that we have nowadays available, there's a huge amount of innovation potential that has been uh, it has been unleashed over the last couple of years from a technology that is thousands of years old. You know, so sometimes we, we have to rethink a little bit the things we do. And, and I think there are also the, the question of services rather than owning something and, uh, and, and using it together with others could, could be a completely different way. So sometimes we're just so much locked into the way we do things that innovation is not the technology itself, but that the technology that we have, that we use it in a different way. And I think that's something, I think there could be much more of that. Um, so that's that's one point. And the second point I want to briefly make, I'm a big, um, well, not wouldn't call fan, but I'm, I'm working a lot and, and think there's a huge potential in digitization and, and using the digital innovation potential for, 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 for the good, for the, for the green goals, for climate protection, pollution control, and so on. And what, what is clear to me is that digitization, digital innovation will happen in the next couple of years. We will not be able to stop it. But the dilemma that happened from my point of view in the last five, 10, 20 years is that digital was neutral in itself, but business oriented or economically oriented, it was basically there to make money. 
and to make our lives easy, but it was not underpinned by a social and environmental uh, uh, code or, or, or clear uh, kind of compass that it's clear that these digital solutions have to be contributing to societal goals. And then I think the European Green Deal is, is an attempt, and that's why we're always talking about the green and digital transition, is an attempt to say is, yes, digital innovation is good, but only if it allows us to reach the, the green goals, the European Green Deal goals as a prerequisite. Because at the moment, I must say, some of the digital innovation is, a, is more a fire accelerant for, for, for sustainability. So we are, we, are, we are going away from some, of the, from, from some of the achievements that we have made in environment policy by using digital tools and not towards. And I think that's really important that innovation needs to be framed uh, within clear uh, objectives, which is a clear uh, kind of compass, so that it, is, uh, that it is doing the good that we want it to do. Innovation in itself is not, uh, is not a good thing. Thank you. That's a very interesting way of framing that, um, and one that seems to relate to some of the things that are coming up in the Q&A as well. Um, I'm going to bring the main panel discussion to a close in just a second, because there are a couple of questions in the Q&A that, that I think are going to help us bring this back towards what we can learn for health um, in particular, because we are focusing a lot in this, in this part on, on partnerships and climate change, which is fine, but I want to bring that around to what we can learn for health governance. Um, but I noticed that Robert has a hand up and I wonder if you just want to, to round off the session for us, Robert. I just want to make a quick, um, maybe controversial point. Um, in, the, in the last, like we have procrastinated as a society for decades now concerning, we have known about the problem a very long time, longer than I was born. And very often fossil fuel companies lobbied that we need more innovation and we need to wait and procrastinate and say, oh, we need more innovation, we need a, maybe a fusion reactor, or we need now hydrogen and blah, blah. My, what, I, what I want to make the point is that we already have so many techniques and, um, and things at hand, we need to apply them quickly and um, yeah, stop waiting for some miracle innovation, which will make everything easy because it's not easy. The transition is hard, we need to work on it. We are all in this together and yeah. Don't wait. This is my point because very often this whole innovation debate is about ah, we need more research. I think that's an excellent, excellent forward-looking uh, point to end on uh, for the way that we should approach. Um, we have asked the speakers to wrap up the session uh, to have a piece of paper and a pen to hand, which I see them all now scrabbling for. Um, and what we wanted them to write down on that piece of paper was as short as possible, the one key factor or thing that they think is crucial to making a partnership successful. And so based on the experiences that you have, maybe the examples that you've given, what is the one factor, critical factor that, that ensures that these partnerships can reach their sustainability goals? So I'm going to give you all 15 seconds. Okay. All right. Uh, can I start then with Yoni? Could you hold up to the screen your one factor? I don't know. Do you see it? Here's where I go. Oh, it's just a lot of money. Brilliant. <laughs> so that one, one unit is describing actually that what we are now having like a carbon tax or carbon price incomes. Then 10 units, we are subsidizing the fossils and 100 units, we don't care about the health effects. And, and, and as long as we keep them like individual silos with different ministries, we will never get it right. So this was my, my key message and also the reasoning for this uh, partnership in this, this area. Super, thank you. Very well illustrated. Um, Robert, can you hold up to the screen your post-it note or piece of paper? Justice, a good word. Yeah, because we need a swift and just transition and it only will work if it's fair and keeps the health and well-being of people in mind and also the planetary boundaries. As a principle to underpin what we do, I think that's that's really important. Aoife, your post-it note or piece of paper. You can see it. Ambition. <laughs> yeah. Apologies for my terrible writing. Um, yeah, because at this stage of the climate crisis, I see quite a lot of partnerships that are basically greenwashing because everyone kind of wants to hop on the bandwagon now. So. Just don't do a partnership unless you're serious about it and gonna really go for what we actually need. Good, good guidance. Uh, and Joaquin, last but not least. I don't know whether you can see that. Oh, but... the blurry background makes it challenging. Uh, oh, vision, something uh, vision. <laughs> yeah, 
that's that's the thing because it's a blurry background. I put common vision common and I put vision. it in green because of course it just needs to be a green vision. On message, well done. <laughs> Nicely branded. Okay, thank you so much to our, our panel speakers. I'm gonna give you just a couple of minutes to catch your breath uh, and and um, and take a, a little moment. Sophia and Sarah are going to join us to reflect a little bit on what we've heard uh, and then to pick up a little bit on what we're seeing in the chat and on the Twitter. Um, so Sophia, can I start with you? Can you just give us a sense of where this sits for you as a young Gasteiner and a, and a public health consultant and, and from your position? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you very much for being part uh, of this panel. And I would like to start that one of the things that stuck with me from the beginning was that um, health is in uh, or should be in all policies. Uh, when we saw those words coming from at the beginning of the session, we see that climate change can impact several risk factors for non-communicable diseases. Um, we saw nutrition coming up, also mental health, and also migrations, which links to the most vulnerable populations. And later on the session, we heard um, the speakers talking about the cost for society for not investing on a greener future. Um, some of the other things that I really like to hear during the session um, were the need of having regulation and the right tools for partnerships to work. We don't need another partnership just for the sake of it. And that innovation, we also don't need it just for the sake of it. Uh, we need to reflect and get a bit away of the buzzwords and get into the deep meaning of what they can be translated into in practice. Um, Another thing linked to this uh, investment part was the need to, to work together towards the common vision and goals and towards investment that has the maximum impact. And by these, we know that it should be evidence-based and should also be monitored and evaluated. And in the case, specific case of health, we were talking about health impact assessment, which can also be included uh, when we talk about climate change. I really liked um, Robert's example on how uh, we can start little by little with small actions and in small communities. And we can be bold, but realistic at the same time. And we can include um, communities that would not necessarily be included um, and foster, um, foster their involvement uh, in this area. Um, just adding uh, another thing that stuck with me was the need of, um, of walking the talk and leading by example. Um, so sometimes starting uh, to do something and having some tangible progress works as an incentive. So this should be highly encouraged. And last but not least, uh, literacy on climate change is really important. We also talked about it during the session and um, it is really important to empower people to make better choices. And um, Ellie, you mentioned that um, uh, people need to understand that, for example, it's better not to fly than uh, uh, at all than choosing the greenest airline. And this reminds me of the introduction of night trends in Europe, which could offer an alternative. People need to have alternatives and adopting um, more conscious behaviors needs to be easy. Otherwise, uh, it's absolutely not going to work as intended. I would just like to hand on a positive note uh, with a small call of action. Uh, we can all start little by little. We've seen many examples during this session. We have food for thought, and I think we're going to leave um, with, uh, with a lot of ideas on how we can make uh, our own contributions. That's super. Thank you, Sophia. Um, without meaning to put you on the spot, does that mean I can immediately come back to you for any questions that you think it's worth us uh, starting with uh, for the Q&A? Um, absolutely. So um, we have uh, here, we have one question that links to what I was saying in the summary um, about behavioral uh, change. So what's the opinion of on individual responsibility in tackling the climate crisis and how it relates to partnerships? That was uh, one question, and um, then I perhaps would read another one so we have, um, so speakers can choose. Um, is the green economy just an illusion, um, or is it uh, something that we can use to avert catastrophe? Um, so, yes, I'll leave it up to you. 
super yes i saw the same questions and i i yeah i thought those were absolutely perfect uh, what i'd like to do is tie the behavioral change question to this this idea of instrumentalism that i think has been raised throughout so Robert was mentioning that, you know, some of this is, is about the instrumental issue of what is cheaper. If the cheaper option is the greener option, that is what people will do. And I, and I wonder if there's something in this idea of us targeting um, sort of rational human decision making, as it were, rather than trying to appeal to some sort of overarching green objective, whether whether as being a bit more practical and, and I guess even a little bit more sceptical about the reason that people make particular decisions might, might get us some more fruitful results. Do any of the panel want to come in on this idea of behavioralism and, and the role of, of nudge and all these sorts of things in, in trying to push people to make decisions in certain ways, or I dare say businesses to act in certain ways? You only mentioned some similar things about the, the sort of incentive structure for businesses. Does anybody want to come in on those sorts of questions? Yoni, please, yeah. Yeah, with this responsibility thing, because we have earned in the, in the rich West our standard of living by using uh, atmosphere as a free garbage place dumpster so i think that we have created our wealth of, of that way and now of course china and others are catching up soon but i think that like industrial revolution that i would feel that our personal responsibility is at least to study that what kind of clean options there are in my life that when i'm changing a car i will study a little bit that can i change that to the cleaner car or avoid the car completely using a shared car or public transport. Then when I'm doing some kind of studies with the new food, my, my daughter is a vegan. And for example, they have teach us the, the really delicious vegan food. So it's more or less like matter of skills. And then when I was in States last time, we got a hamburgers with impossible food and, and beyond meat. And they taste it really well. So I don't need to use any meat anymore with hamburgers after that experience. And now there are more products coming even from Finland. So this is what I feel that our responsibility to at least study a little bit of the new things. If they work for your life, then do it. If they don't work, you don't need to do it, but at least to study that what clean options there are available. And that I feel like resp individual responsibility. Uh, yeah, I, I think those are really interesting examples. So, so individual responsibility is clearly part of that to inform oneself. But I wonder, so the example that you gave about, well, can I have an electric car? Then can I ditch the car altogether? Is that decision to ditch the car altogether perhaps put some responsibility on the state or how we want to, to set these things up to have provided the infrastructure and the public transport that means it is possible for, you, for us as individuals to ditch the car? I wonder if this split between individual responsibility and state responsibility, which again speaks so closely to the discussions we have about people's responsibility for their health and, uh, and the maintenance of their health, that that's where this sort of sort of discussion is going. Um, Aoife, please, you have a hand up. Yeah, I mean, I think that ties in really nicely with um, what we said earlier. I can't remember who said it, but these these different ministries who have different responsibilities for different things. Um, but quite often, you know, like so, for example, my work on shipping, I'm quite often dealing with the Ministry of Environment slash Climate Change, depending on the country, the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Transport. And they all have their varying interests. But what we need to do, and I think this is kind of where the nudge would come in on the government level, is to make sure they're all making their decisions on the basis of climate change and health. And then secondly, on other things, whereas that is not the case at the moment. So I, I mean, I'm all about nudges on an individual level and on a business level, that's great, but I would much rather nudge our governments to actually put the appropriate regulation in place that will actually solve this thing. That sounds like an important level for nudging. Um, I just want to allow Sarah to come back in if she's able to do so and give us her, her thoughts on the session. Are you, can we hear you, Sarah? Hi. Can oh, we can hear you, super. Sorry, Great. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, so I would like to pick up on three things because Sophia has already summarized it so well. But one thing that really stuck with me um, was that if you act on one element, you you will trigger other things happening right so um, i think robert mentioned it uh, start with one action and then you will see that it works and you can do another action and i think this can also work in in, in partnerships that um similarly if you have done a partnership with someone then the trust is here you know it works why don't we do it again so i think it's this virtual cycle that um that we can start with just doing one thing uh, after the other. Um, then the second point that I really liked was, I think Yoni said that um, on, 
on this conceptual change that uh, a partnership should not just be uh, industry gives the money and then you know a bit more of this charity thinking and we heard that in other sessions as well uh, a partnership is recipro reciprocity so it there should be um you know, a, an incentive for, for a company to do it. And I'm sure there, there are incentives uh, uh, to, to become greener and it's the, the right thing to do, right? I think for us as, as, as Novartis, um, we don't think it's uh, nice to have to become climate neutral by 2030, it's a must. So, so I think that's uh, something that many other companies will also um, jump on this uh, wagon. Um, and then the last point, and maybe it links also to, to the Twitter activity. So there, there is some activity on Twitter. People share uh, retweets, they like it, but there is not so much concrete, you know, link between health and climate. Because uh, for the moment, um, uh, organizations that are active on climate, it's more on the energy part, right, on, on the energy transition. But there is not so much this link between health and climate. And I hope we will see that uh, more and more in the future. Um, and uh, I was just thinking, so there is this uh, uh, innovative uh, medicines initiative that uh, have um, been in for the last years, and now it's change to innovative health initiative to make it broader to include more stakeholders so can we have a climate so project within that so that that would be really great thank you that sounds like a good example of scaling up can i ask you sarah also are there any questions from coming up from the twitter discussion that it's it's worth us bringing into the or is it all represented in the q a already it's all represented in q a there is noise and interest but i think people are still searching for where, where where should we be active or what should we do so uh, that's okay. why it's, it's very timely to have this conversation okay great thank you i think uh, or i wonder rather if part of the reason for that is that that we need to make this this connection between what we're talking about in the climate sector with the health sector a little bit clearer and i want to pick up a question in the q a and a few people have mentioned this term greenwashing and i think this is a real particularly in the health sector there is a concern about partnerships somebody earlier used the term public private partnerships which i find fascinating because in my own work i found that that word has disappeared that we now refer to them as multi-stakeholder partnerships because public private partnerships has become a bit problematic, particularly in the UK, that's not really a term we use for these things anymore. So, so I think this is a really question, uh, important question for us to address. The way I'd like to frame, frame it is as a conflict of interest question. So do any of the panelists have a view on how we deal with the inherent conflict of interest that comes with trying to bring together partners from the private sector who have a responsibility to generate a profit and are, and are here for that purpose? with those in the public sector and civil society and other elements to to try and uh, tackle questions where it's not necessarily apparent that all of our interests would align it, are there reflections on whether that is insurmountable you know we had a, a an option in the poll at the beginning that, that to allow people who felt that way to express that and it wasn't a very commonly held view but but maybe people have some input that they can can offer us on on how these things can be tackled if there are appropriate mechanisms we can use to try and mitigate conflicts of interest anything around this conflict of interest issue that i think is really important particularly for the public health community Eva, please yeah i think that's super important and in climate it's probably a bit different to health because you know if you think of big tobacco or whatever you just kind of want to get rid of them you don't need them to solve the issue as such whereas in climate if we are talking about getting rid of shell and bp and these other oil majors in one way it sounds great i mean there's still the demand there as, as yoni said but on the other side what other uh organizations do you have that have the capital and skills that are going to be able to replace uh at the scale we need the energy that we need as a society so Unfortunately, we're probably going to be working with these actors for a long time to come. I mean, maybe I shouldn't say unfortunately, um, but to be honest, I like I really don't see how those partnerships can work without really uh, concrete regulation um, as they are now. They kind of do a little bit at the edges because they kind of see how the wind is changing. But ultimately, if you are a company that has built up your um, entire business model around polluting for free, I can't see how that is going to change unless you are regulated to change. Do you have any sense of the kind of regulation that's needed? Are there any examples that we could draw on in health that's used elsewhere? 
Well, I mean, carbon pricing is uh, a good one. I mean, which is which is you know used a lot in health as well, right? I mean, I think we're going to need uh, like carbon pricing would have worked, I think, on its own if we'd put it in in the eighties and at the right price and with the right cap and all the rest of it. Unfortunately, now it's kind of too late. So we're going to also just need industrial policy policies that mandate you cannot do this, you must do this. Um, you know, very command and control, um, which are quite often more expensive than carbon pricing, but at the same time, they kind of hide it uh, in terms of price from the public. So it's it's just one of those things. We're going to need all the tools in the regulatory toolbox, toolbox really. I think that's a compelling answer. Robert, please. Yeah, I would like to echo what um, Eve just said and also comment on one of the questions in the Q&A concerning the green economy. Um, I feel very strongly about this because uh, we cannot have infinite growth on a finite planet. We need to say goodbye to this fairy tale once for all. And I don't see the problem that a company makes a profit, but the profit has not, should, like it cannot increase infinitely always. It's, I think it's okay if they make a profit, if they make a living, that's fine, but why do we have to make, make more turnover next year? So I, I would like to echo what Eve said, we need all the tools in the toolbox and one of them must be, for example, a moratorium on fossil fuels, phase out fossil fuels as soon as possible and have rules, for example, that we don't invest in new fossil fuel infrastructure or that we don't subsidize any kerosene or shipping or aviation because they are not taxed or whatever. So, and, and those regulations, many people and many companies like Shell, they, they won't like it. Those interests will not align. And yeah, one way, one radical way could be that, for example, the Netherlands, which is the main owner of Shell, when we take this example, they nationalized the company, set a date to phase out and um, yeah, did like elite so how says the company close it down it's really radical but it's what needs to happen because we cannot continue polluting our atmosphere because we are all going to suffer that's the, yeah and thank you for picking up the the green economy question as well that's that's super um there's a related question in the q a um again open to any anybody on the panel how are partnerships taking into consideration environmental justice and the unequal impact of environmental determinants of health i think you, you know, we could also ask that about health based partnerships, you know, how are they taking into account inequalities that exist and their impact. Um, but there's a tack on to that question, which is about whether they're able to do so with the scarcity of available data at the European level. So I think this is a really important point that we can only ever address these things insofar as we know about them and knowing about them tends to be where where things start to struggle. Does anybody want to come in on that and, and reflect a little bit? Uh, Yoni? Yeah. Yeah, now there is this very big discussion starting on this energy poverty and how for example that influences people and there is a big danger doing totally wrong conclusions on that and i have seen some really alarming messages from biden from the french politicians spanish prime minister and such and the message has been that in order to avoid energy poverty we need to keep fossil prices cheap and this is totally the wrong solution for this problem because that will tie the social security with the fossil power, so fossil price. And then we are going to the same route than Russia, Saudi Arabia, Iraq and Iran. So we are building more societal like uh, subsidies based on fossil energy. So this is something the biggest conflict of interest what I see now. And we clearly should separate it. The, B, the companies don't have a business cases if they don't let the, the pollution price go up it means fossil prices but then we need to subsidize the people with money and this carbon pricing seems they will create tremendous financial incomes and for example in california there is a system that there is this climate investment fund where about half can be allocated to help the low-income people and now the europe commission has proposed this social fund so i don't know whether it as a structure is is, is it optimal but the idea is excellent Somehow we need to sub support the people with money and then some other maybe tax like uh, changes, but not with fossil fuels. I think that's a really interesting point about where we focus our regulation. I know there's a lot of work going on at European level on energy poverty. Um, Joaquin, please. Yeah, but building on that a little bit, I want to also say that um, in one of the things, the, the guiding principles in the European Green Deal is uh, a green transition can only be successful if it's a just transition. 
and that has has very many elements and and i mean already already the um uh, the fund was mentioned but i think there are also many many uh, activities going on and when i bring back now the health dimension and bringing uh, pollution climate and health together i think one of the points made in the in the in the in the question is a pertinent one is i mean we first have to know where the injustice is the inequalities are before we can do something in a meaningful and effective way and i think that's something that uh, we have certainly i mean i've seen uh, a lot of initiatives over the last uh, two or three years where we're really trying to join forces again between the different departments bringing data together i mean there's a whole story about this uh, question of, of of breaking down data silos you know and 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 really um, bringing together uh, the knowledge from the health communities and health constituencies with uh, those who work on, on, on inequalities, for example, our colleagues in DG Employment, for example, have a lot of data on, on, social, on, on differences uh, that, that related to the social status and social context and, and, and bringing environment data and climate data together. And, and that's, a, that's, that's a big challenge. I mean, we've been working in our little data silos in the past as well. So we're at the start of this, but there's a huge potential. And, and let me maybe also linking to, to earlier discussions, just briefly mention an initiative that the colleagues have launched uh, only, only a few months ago, which is the European Climate and Health Observatory. And that's exactly one of, the, one of these initiatives to start bringing these data together. That's not ex exhaustive and it's not gonna be uh, giving all the answers, but it allows to, to make these connections and, and foster more of this uh, joined up and integrated thinking. And, uh, and I think that's one of the keys is to really uh, better understand how uh, we have effects on, uh, on, on people, on equality, on, uh, on, on, on uh, income uh, linked to, to the environment and the climate agenda. And then we can, we can have targeted solutions and make then also transfers in terms of, uh, of, of money. So, so that's, uh, that's from my side. I'll put the, the link in the, to the observatory in the chat for everybody who's interested. Thanks. That would be wonderful. Thank you. I think that's, that's a lovely example. I was also thinking as you were speaking about the state of health in the EU exercise, which is a similar thing where the commission yeah, led by exactly. DG Sante had put a lot of time and effort into the data collection because we recognise that a lot of the time the problem with public health is that we simply don't know where the inequalities are and, and, and bringing that data together at European level has its challenges, but it's, it's certainly moved forward in the last couple of years. Um, super. Okay. I had a, a slightly more higher level question that I think it might be nice just to, to sort of wrap up with if that's okay with everybody and that question was about international level agreements so we we got into this discussion primarily because the the sustainable development goals have enshrined this this goal about partnership and, and increasingly we talk about partnerships as a good form of of governance and I'm wondering how important that international level commitment to the idea of partnership is for each of you on our panel in the way that you work. So for example, for IFA, how important is it to have an international level agreement to help you organize and promote campaigns and things? Is it, is it useful to be able to refer back to that for the commission? What does it mean to have that enshrined within the sustainable development goals? Does that push the commission to put more of an emphasis on partnerships? I don't, I, I don't wanna push anybody to come in who, who doesn't want to, but it, it strikes me that each of you will have engaged with these international level pushes for a greater utilization of partnerships. And I just wonder if there's something to learn about the role that those play. Uh, yeah, Aoife, please. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely um, say something on that and maybe to link it back to the previous question on um, inequality as well, because this is one of the huge things with the climate is that those who have contributed the least are going to be affected the worst. And so from my work, um, especially on international shipping, we see a huge amount of push for those international agreements from those that are climate vulnerable because they see that as one of the only ways to protect themselves. Um, so even though things like the Paris Agreement in climate change, it's 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 got some great goals in there, but it's not very concrete. You can't uh, you know enforce it. There's no way to like bring anyone to court on it. But it's been instrumental in a number of court cases in different countries. In fairness, it's still absolutely uh, vital to have those global goals. I think that we're all aiming to. Like the number of times I refer to the Paris Agreement temperature goals um, is like it's got to be many times a day. And without that, we kind of just be like, oh yeah, you know, the science says you should reduce. So it's really, really important to have those ambitious international agreed, we're all, you know, going to the same direction. 
paper. Thank you. I think, yeah, that, that's exactly what I was trying to get at. I think these things sometimes feel like they're a bit um, woolly and and because the, the bindingness of them is, is problematic, like, but but that, that idea that they're useful as leverage and as a focal point, I think is really important. Has anybody else got any reflections on, on the importance of these things for the work they do? Uh, Joaquin, please. Yeah, I mean, for us, of course, I mean, the, the, the global uh, agreements are, are essential. I think we have, have as Europe, uh, only possibility to solve these big problems if we work globally together in a multilateral level. And that's why these reference points are extremely important. And you mentioned the so, uh, sustainable development goals. I think the EU, if I remember correctly, back in those days was actually one of those also promoting the inclusion of SDG 16 and 17 over and above the, so what, what I would call more thematic goals. So we have 15 thematic goals on health and, uh, and oceans and, and climate and so on. But, but it was really interesting to see that, uh, that the, the goals 16 and 17 and the sustainable development goals came in, which are more institutional goals and more kind of talk about justice, they talk about uh, institutions and they talk about partnerships. I mean, in particular in the, in the uh, SDG 17. And so I think, I mean, it's, it's always a question, what type of partnership uh, do, we, do we mean? I mean, are we talking about a local partnership uh, in the community uh, with neighbors, so to say, or are we talking about a global partnership? And here, I think that, that, that the main message I would like to say is we need them at all levels. There is no partnership that is not able to contribute at all levels. And we just need to make sure that these multi-level partnerships, let me call it them that way, that they all connect together again towards a common vision. I think that's that's the key. That's the challenge in the end. But but partnerships is the only way to go. I mean, what else would you do? Do we do it on your own? I mean, I think we all know that this is not not the most effective way and also not the most fun way to do things, is to try to to to, to struggle for yourself. So obviously, you join forces, you, you build a team, you create a partnership, and then you work together towards the so for me, there is not a question, is our partnerships important? Of course, they are important, but it's more the how. How do we manage to have with these multi-level partnerships at the global level, bring everybody together, as well as at the local level, to, to, to make a movement that then brings us to, to, to carbon neutrality and the other uh, ambitious goals that we have set ourselves for 2050? Thanks. I like the way you framed that as so we're all we're, we're tackling two kinds of silos in a way we're tackling our horizontal silos between sectors but then also our vertical silos which is linking all of these partnerships up I also think we don't often enough define good governance as how fun it is to operate and that's a nice way to teams is more fun than on your own uh Yoni please yeah the, the key international agreements are for example like finalizing the article six which is then completing the the rules how to calculate is uh, carbon market kind of activities and I really wish that that will happen this year in Glasgow and uh, then the other one is that for example that this taxonomy is to you started taxonomy maybe that is not suitable as such for other countries but the investor community needs it and then the investors work around the globe so the, we need to have some synchronization with taxonomy and then we need to have less reporting tools like Erki Liikanen, he, he joined actually CLC this week. So he's the head of the IFRS task force for the, for the reporting. And they are addressing now some similar issues than TCFD. So he works with Mark Carney. So there is the standardization. Then I would like to have a standardization also with WTO with the carbon footprints. So if we don't have a common way to calculate carbon footprints, we, we are making our life really difficult. And then the same applies to circular economy. So when we are buying things around the world, many things from China, but really around the world. So if you don't have data from the goods and materials, what we buy, the reuse of them will be very difficult because then we don't know what the material is, is that how it's maintained and how, what, what kind of purposes it can be used. So I think that these kind of agreements would be like enabling agreements, enabling the more global transition for the, for the green economy. And then finally, my final comment was that when there was a talk on innovation, I added there a link for a very interesting report called Paris Effect by Systemic IQ. Jeremy Oppenheim is also our member and he made an excellent presentation to us. And this is like a collection of the disruptive changes within different branches. And it's really fascinating reading that how quick, quickly some, some uh, domains are, are developing. So this was my like final comments. Thank you very much for the, joining the panel. That's very kind of you, Yoni. Thank you. Um, Robert, did you want to come in on higher level agreements or, or not so much? <laughs> yeah, just, just one um, last sentence from me. 
Um, I think all these high level agreements are absolutely necessary as a guiding force, but I feel also strongly about it. We need less conversation and more action because we have the Paris agreements, but if we um, those terms and goals we set out, the countries, the national German contributions, if they are all fulfilled, which they are not, we end up with three degrees more global warming, which is catastrophic. So even if we fulfill all the targets, we are still very much short. If you look at the UN gap report, for example, so we need much, much more action and maybe um, less conferences. <laughs> That's, yeah, that's an important an important point to end on to to say that we definitely need to take things away and and act on what we have what we have heard and what we have learned. Um, I think that's super. So so we continue to see partnerships emphasised as a, a an effective tool for health governance. So I think this is the right discussion to be having. I think what it's shown us, not least of all, because there's a whole stack of questions in the Q and A that we just haven't had time to get to. And I've tried to prioritise those that are moving us a bit more towards lessons for health. So apologies to those who wanted to hear more a bit more about the climate experience. What this has shown us is how much we have to learn. I think from our colleagues in environment who've been working in this in this partnership way, perhaps for a little bit longer, and and can teach us how to manage the the challenges that it faces and, and to make the most of the benefits that it has um, and that this is the right discussion to continue having there are a stack of links to useful resources that people have kind of been putting in the chat so please please do check those out um this session was born out of a young foreign gas time discussion about multi-stakeholder partnership so i am confident that we will have the chance to follow up these discussions and i look forward to being involved in in that very soon uh, which means that it remains only for me to thank the Gastein Forum for allowing us to host the event, the Young Forum Gastein for organisation in particular, Mari, who's been working very hard to put the whole thing together, uh, to Sarah and to Sophia for joining us from the Young Gastein side, uh, and to our distinguished panel of speakers, thank you so much for joining us, um, and enjoy the rest of the conference, everybody. All right, bye for now.